Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley, and today on the show we have Chris Caldwell and Zeke Earl, two really great filmmakers. You may have seen their first film, Prospect, which was the feature version of a short film they had put out. It's a great film starring Pedro Pascal, but now they're going about creating this whole new project, this whole cinematic universe called The Fringe. And they've recently released a teaser around this whole project that they're doing where they're going about a brand new way, using brand new technology to be able to keep control over the story they want to tell, but also include all the filmmakers involved that are helping tell it and the community around the story, the fans of this thing, making a community on how they lift up and tell and develop this whole universe. There's a lot involved. It's a brand new way of doing things. So it's very interesting. And I'm going to let the guys detail it so I don't butcher it here. So I'm going to just shut up now and get into it with them. But before I do, there are little audio issues here and there. So you'll have to ignore those. But now, I'll shut up with that little disclaimer and get into it with Chris and Zeke. So just to start us out, because there's a lot of exciting stuff I want to get into to hear about this new thing that you guys are doing that really sounds amazing and I'm I'm very, very excited about it. But I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit in a few ways. First, starting with you two as filmmakers. How did you get into this? What sort of led to this point? I know, you know, you did a feature before this, which I loved and I'd love to talk a little bit about that as well. But just what was your intro into filmmaking? Definitely not very straightforward or conventional. We were both English majors. We were college friends who did like creative writing classes together. And then I always had the ambition of kind of getting into filmmaking, but was not at a university that even offered filmmaking. And we graduated into the recession uh, around 2010 and we couldn't get jobs. So uh, 10 years ago, I watched a shit ton of your videos. Oh, really? Nice. You, Philip Bloom, no film school. Like that, that was my film school. I bought a Canon 7D and started a company. And we, you know, started making like little things and then those things got bigger. Uh, But we always had the ambition to kind of get into the, you know, narrative. We started making short films and got a short film into South by Southwest. And there started connecting with the actual industry and and sort of snowballed from there. Was that Prospect, your short film Prospect that got into South by? Uh, It did, but we did one before that called In the Pines. That was even like like a no budget short film a couple years earlier. Oh, okay. And I think another part of this story is that, you know, we're up in Seattle And we've been siloed up here for this whole journey. And I think that sort of had an impact on kind of the route that we took. It just, you know, in the non-traditional nature of it. And so there was just a lot of figuring things out for ourselves. And so um, the kind of approach that that took was to, you know, start making money shooting commercials up in Seattle and then routing a lot of that resource back into our production company, equipping us with the tools to be able to shoot anything we wanted at will. And then that sort of blossomed into our short films and our larger narrative ambitions. And then that that sort of dynamic kind of continues to this day. We still operate a commercial production company. It's grown as we've grown. And, you know, being sort of self uh, subsistent up here, uh, allowing us to sort of you know, make money with commercials and dedicate time to develop our narrative projects with a bit more freedom and a bit less reliance on that sort of initial capital to kick something off the ground. Jumping right ahead to your, I guess, second short film I got into South by Prospect. How did that come about? Because that ended up being that feature, which again, was great. I loved. Did the short film come about because you wanted to make the feature or did you have a general idea, make the short film and then develop the feature out of that? Which which came first? Yeah. So with our, our first short film that got into South by, we didn't intend on making a feature and we were surprised at oh. like the reception from the wider industry. And instead of trying to like turn that into a feature, like, no, let's do another one. Let's make another short film that's designed designed to be that kind of conventional calling card to get a feature made. Nice. So then how did the feature for Prospect happen? Oh, man. Well, to condense a three or four year process (laughs) into a few sentences. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a grueling effort. I guess maybe I want to focus on, I I mean, all in all, it's like the short film let people in Hollywood see us really for the first time. And we, at that point, had Scott Glassgold attached as a producer. We then were able to get signed with the talent agency WME. And we attached Chris Weitz, who's a very established Hollywood director and his company, Depth of Field, on as producers, and then, you know, went after a slew of financers for years. And over time, one of them, you know, took the bait and financed it. But 
The thing I want to focus on, because it's also kind of relevant to what we're doing now, is that for a feature film, we did something fairly unconventional. So budget for prospect was about $3.5 million, which I will admit is actually rather large for a first time indie feature film. But it was also super small for what we wanted to do, which was create an entirely original sci-fi world. Right. We had a vision for incredibly detailed production design. And the only way we could pull that off in that budget space, which was like, you know, a little closer to like a horror movie, was to open our own production design shop. So along with, you know, our short film and a script and an incredibly detailed book of concept art, we were also presenting financiers with like a business plan. Like, awesome. look, look at my budget for screwdrivers. Like, and honestly, a lot of them were like, this is cool, <laughs> this is cool. And then they got to that part of it and they kind of freaked out because they're like, wait, whoa, no, 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 no. We're not gonna like, maybe we trust you guys to make a movie. We don't also trust you to open like a shop. And that's what it finally took is that over these years of financing attempts, that plan got better and better until, you know, we did convince someone. But ultimately, like, this was, this movie was made by an art collective. And that's, that's an important distinction that, you know, we couldn't afford to go out and hire the conventional industry. We got an old boat building warehouse in Seattle. It's like we bought a CNC machine. We were buying, you know, 3D printers and hiring our friends, people who we knew, who knew how to make stuff. And it was this incredible atmosphere. It was like, I mean, literally the biggest thrill of my life because, you know, it felt like a, a perpetual summer camp. Everyone had this like giddiness around the process and treated the film as a passion project. Yeah. You know, this wasn't just another paycheck. This wasn't just another job. We had this crew of people working like nights and weekends and just like pouring their soul into making something like distinctive. And I, I mean, I think that's what's really special about Prospect is the world. It's way better than it deserves to be just kind of given given its economic space. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do, you know, not necessarily by design, but definitely in effect with the, the unconventional nature, the eclectic nature of the team, pulling a lot of people who had never worked on a movie before and never built props before, but they did have a lot of experience designing and engineering and, and fabricating other things, be it cabinets or bikes or, you know, all sorts of different industrial design. And that ended up fusing really well with our kind of world building and production design ethos around, you know, having that sense of heft to the reality of the world to make it internally consistent and logical. And so we had people designing things as if they were actual things, not just props that just needed to be surf uh, serviceable on camera for a few minutes, but something that actually made sense as a design that felt like it would be a real object in the real world. Yeah. And that's something I'm particularly proud of with the, you know, just the manifestation of the world through the production design is it, you know, that's what we were going for is it to have that heft of the real in every corner. I love that. And I love your approach of just doing things differently. I do find that there seems to be like this resting on things need to be done the way things are done, which is just not the case, especially in the low budget world. I've always found like, you know, if I need a screw, I could probably still just use a nail. You know what I mean? And and so I love that aspect about what you guys are doing, just bringing in talent where you can bring it from and then just guiding that force into the, you know, your very unique vision. So I really love that about it. And you ended up getting Pedro Pascal, which is no small thing. Did that end up happening after the financing came through or before? Uh, after. Okay. I mean, he responded to the script. He really liked the the unique language uh, of the character, which I think is what made it kind of stand out maybe from a more conventional sci-fi project. Um, and obviously it was just like a pleasure to work with. That guy walks on set and like, I, he doesn't need direction. He just, it's like just brings it. It right. was like such, such a joy to to watch him like, you know, walk into this world. We've been like, you know, creating all these really, really fine details, but like you have to have somebody with his talent to like sell it, bring it to life. And this is, you know, this was, this was before the Mandalorian, but it yeah. was after Game of Thrones and, and definitely like Oberyn is a favorite character and just, uh, it, it just felt with, with, you know, his character in Prospect Ezra is super loquacious and really larger than life. And um, the work he did on Game of Thrones was just like kind of made him a shoe in for that role. So, yeah, he was amazing. So now you're you're moving on to this new project. Are you saying the title of the project yet? Are you able to say that? Uh, we're calling it The Fringe. The Fringe. Okay, so now you're, you're moving on to The Fringe. And the thing that's most unique about it is how you're going about actually getting it funded, actually getting it made, just your ideas around putting this film together, and which is what I'm most excited to talk to you about, obviously. But before we get to that, can we talk a little bit about how this specific story came about? You know, there's a little 
chicken and the egg situation of, you know, the the story versus, you know, how you're getting it made, I guess, to some degree. But I assume you had the full, you know, feature script and everything before you got to this point. Or were the the two coinciding, you figuring out, okay, we're oh, going to yeah, make this thing and here's how I, we're going to do it at the same time. Because it's so I wouldn't know how to answer the chicken big, and the egg question. Is the reason I'm um, asking. One thing to point out first is yeah. actually is the fringe isn't the film, it's a universe. Oh, okay. We want this to be bigger than a single movie like a- absolutely so we're trying we're trying to outline something um that's much larger the first film will actually likely be called something else we haven't actually haven't settled on that title but yeah i i guess like which angle to approach it from is always is a right. question <laughs> totally. I, I guess part of it part of our motivation is you know after prospect uh Pro- prospect's been sort of a, a slow boil it, it came out in theaters didn't get seen very, very widely. It was a low budget film with no marketing. And then, you know, as it it found its audience, though, gradually in various online formats, eventually hitting Netflix, where we've gotten like a lot of attention and uh, response. And so, you know, we've been kind of sort of presented with a few different pathways on how to kind of continue our career at this point. And, you know, it did well on Netflix. We have Netflix like talking to us and like saying, hey, what's next, guys? Are you interested in this or that? And we're, you know, we're obviously not turning those conversations down. We're very interested. Sure. But at the same time, a few things about how like our experience with the traditional industry making prospect has us kind of potentially interested in some alternatives, which is really what the fringe is all about. So the thing that's important to understand is we don't own prospect. We had to completely sign away the IP for that project to get it made. So if there were to be a sequel or something of prospect, we would simply just be kind of attached as hired talent because now, you know, the the owners of, of the IP are the masters of it, are the ones who get to decide what to do with it. And so it's kind of, you know, we not that we would necessarily be interested in that, but it's 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 not as motivating. What we're trying to do with the fringe is set up film financing in such a way that allows us to retain ownership of the IP, which is just not how anything's done right now. And this is like not, and I want to be very careful to be like, I am incredibly thankful to the people that funded Prospect. Like as far as like a first time feature film experience, it was like a dream. But at the end of the day, it's just the way the system works that we spend years and years crafting this immaculately detailed world. And then we just sort of have to give it away. Furthermore, it's just like getting back to that shop, getting back to that art collective, these people who poured such a tremendous amount of their time and energy, much, much more so again, than people who are just kind of working for a paycheck. They're not entered into that ownership equation either. Like they're, you know, it's like, what's like, what's the incentive to keep this kind of unique way of making a world from happening too. And that's also kind of lacking. It's like, you know, these are the artists that made this film what it is. In my mind, in in my utopian view of the world that doesn't exist right now, they deserve IP ownership as well. So kind of, you know, the genesis of The Fringe is like, all right, we are starting to kind of like create this cool kind of, you know, texture of sci-fi. We want to expand these ideas. We want to expand. We want to create, you know, a new universe. But can we set up in such a way that makes the way we made Prospect sustainable? A way that actually allows this art collective to, you know, be able to control the future of the IP to be able to profit from it in the future and, you know, kind of make this sort of like dream way of of making a film. And obviously there's a a lot of details now how this is going to work. Yeah. Looking back on the experience of making Prospect, and I think there's a lot of like you know, retrospection and, and, and discovery that has happened since then. But, you know, when we made Prospect, we were very just eager to make that first movie and yeah. to sort of break that seal yeah. and to like push into that. And so it was very singularly focused, whatever it takes, who cares about the money? We just want the opportunity to make this. And through the whole process of making Prospect, of of building this art collective, of of doing an act of, of collective world building with a bunch of people, coming out the other end, realizing, you know, how much we are are, you know, kids who grew up on Star Wars and want to like build those caliber level of worlds, we got to make our, you know, one indie feature, which was very much designed to be this sort of fly on the wall look into this expansive other universe. That's how we wanted it to feel. Yeah. But then coming out the other end, it's like there's so much opportunity to like build on all this stuff we've developed. But now there's all these like practical hurdles to actually do that. There's not the freedom of expression in terms of like continuing to develop the world and the storytelling. And and we're realizing that that's really what we want. And that's what's precious to us. So with The Fringe, we are, you know, we're attempting 
attempting to start with the, the universe and to build a cinematic universe from the ground up with the, the intention of it being expandable and expressible in all these different ways. Of all these little like small stories and amazing little adventures and characters and across multiple mediums too. You know, we're starting point is, you know, the, the precedent that we've established a feature film, but we see this, you know, in success as having the opportunity to expand into series, into graphic novels, you know, maybe video games and, and all sorts of other forms of narrative art. Because, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the things that's sort of distinctive to our approach to storytelling and narrative development is it's very, it's very world first. And if we're going to be, if we're going to be telling stories in the sci-fi space, we don't want the world to feel incidental to the story. Yeah. We want to feel like we're looking into, you know, we, we've got a portal into something that's real and alive and that extends beyond the edges of the purview of, say, a single film. Right. It's got all sorts of other stuff going on because it has that heft of reality. And then, you know, we want to be able to capitalize on that by telling as many stories as we want within this universe. And I only want to butt in to say that, like, the way film financing is set up right now does not incentivize that. Like, no. that is massively <laughs> inefficient. You know, we'll even get, like, thrown a random idea like from a producer be like hey would you guys want to do a take on that we're like yeah but I have to develop the in-world economy for a month first like it just isn't like how things work but Chris maybe real fast because I think you're better than me maybe describing also just like what is the fringe universe going to be like before you know we really dive into the the financing part yeah so the fringe is a place it's the setting for all these stories to take place and it's essentially it's you know it's it's the unincorporated frontier you know, past the edge of civilized space. It's outside all of the, you know, established public transit routes. Um, It's months away from the more populated centralized systems. And it's, you know, you could think of it as akin to the Louisiana Purchase before everything was incorporated into statehood. It's the Wild West. Um, It's this big sandbox. You've got uh, corporate offshoots doing resource extraction operations that are fueled by labor exploitation. You have fringe religious and political groups that have trekked out their uh, lured by the lawlessness and the autonomy that they can find there. Um, but really for the fringe cinematic universe, the, the class of people that we're most focused on are what we're calling drifters. This is a broad class of people. It's all sorts of freelancers, largely blue collar. You know, you've got hunters, trappers, uh, miners, engineers, gastrotechs, which is like our sci-fi version of a chef, bounty hunters, mercenaries, and really kind of the, the kind of core angle that we're focusing on is exploring this world through the perspectives of these types of people. I think to characterize it tonally, uh, you could describe it as Star Wars meets Deadwood. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> but but one important yeah. distinction on that is kind of leaning more into the Deadwood camp of things is we're not so interested in things like the Jedi or the Galactic Senate or these big overarching entities that are like battling it out for the fate of humanity. We are more focused on the small folks in this universe, the drifters. So for example, it's, you know, stories about the indentured laborer who spent his entire life mucking about in the Powerball swamps, but then one day snaps and jacks a ship from his employer and sets off into the fringe with a, uh, you know, a posse of corporate mercenaries on his tail. Um, or say like an, an experimental gastrotech who's trekking through the wilderness of an alien planet and discovers some new species of truffle that has has transcendental psychedelic properties, but then gets swept up by a claim jumping family of disgraced oligarchs who are scraping at everything they can to reclaim their former prestige and has to navigate their fucked up internal family politics in order to make it out with their bounty. I mean, all that to say it's like, you know, it's 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 one of the mantras that sort of is guiding this world is small stories big world. Man, I love that. You know, unlike a lot of other sci-fi and fantasy, it's not focused on, you know, the chosen one, uh, these elite knights with superpowers or, or even, <laughs> like the fate of the galaxy. It's like, it's about, it's about real people yeah. but get, you know, and, and how they handle extreme circumstances. And that, you know, a lot of that goes back to sort of our, 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 our roots in our just deep love for Westerns. Yeah. I love, I really love that. I, I, I'm a huge fan of genre, especially sci-fi. I adore sci-fi. One of my favorites by far. And it's, you know, I'm not against the, the one, the chosen one thing, but it's so much. And it's really those stories that you're talking about that I find myself like TV does it a lot and does it well, those smaller stories. That's what you really attach to. So this marrying of those two things that you're talking about sounds really exciting. Good. (laughs) (laughs) That's great to hear. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, Zeke, I think you were going to say something. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to tack on. And I, you know, maybe this isn't worth including. I feel like what we're always trying to achieve is, uh, you know, in the Coen brothers' true grit. Yeah. When they're like out in the in snow and they encounter this frontier dentist. It's just like one of my favorite scenes from all time. And I feel like that's always like, it's just like, you know, weirdos having to like create their own reality almost outside the civilization and just like the fascinating like things that can happen in that space are, are always what we're trying to create. Well, and I think also fundamentally, this goes back to our childhoods, you know, like yeah. everything always does. But, you know, it's the, it's watching Star Wars for the first time with the visual encyclopedia mm -hmm. and digging into all that stuff and, 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 and getting so much more runway out of, imagining the back alleys of Moss Eisley and all these like weird guns and ships that you only see for two seconds in the actual movie yeah. and that sort of imaginative play and uh, you know what we what we want to do with this universe is to explore those you know dirty grubby little pockets in the corners of the universe with a fixation on you know compelling real characters that are just trying to survive and trying to carve their own path through the chaos you know it, some some important distinguishing elements like there's a you know this is this is all wild fantastical territory but there's also a sort of groundedness at least internally that we want to bring to this like life out in the fringe is hard space travel in this universe is tedious and expensive you're not just zipping around there's a strong sense of the economic limitations of everything that's involved technology is not magic it it offers little convenience and these sort of restrictions are important to us because they they keep the stakes more visceral it's not these big lofty you know grand sort of like superpower adventures it keeps the focus on the characters and their choices and it's that that's i guess that's kind of what i mean by like bringing the heft of reality to an uh, a, a really imaginative playful world where it, it's internally consistent and it's it's you're watching people you know navigate their own ecosystems just like we do in the real world you know that type of thing is for me where you get the most emotionally honest and connected stories and then adding the fantastic of what you're putting together with that world it just all sounds very interesting and very ambitious especially you know not just the world you're creating for this singular film but what you're saying it's a whole universe of things graphic novels video games multiple films maybe tv series i really like the grand scope that you guys are thinking and and a totally new direction to do it so i would love now to start diving in to that, how you are taking this brand new approach that I've personally never heard of to start kicking off this whole universe that you are making. Yeah, well, we are neck deep to the chaos and the Wild West that is the Web3 blockchain cryptocurrency whatever you want to call it, uh, space. You're in the fringe. <laughs> exactly. That's not the, uh, the pairing of those two things, not, not accidental. Yeah, I, I feel like it's always like, you know, there's, there's a technological aspect of it. There's an economic aspect of it. There's a cultural aspect of it. So like kind of how to approach it, I guess maybe to start just at the very like highest level. Like what we're doing right now is we're working with our art collective, um, the concept artists that made Prospect, actually a lot of the actual like spaceship design and prop designers to create a, a huge collection of characters that we're calling drifters uh, that will be for sale as NFTs. So this is kind of the entry point to the universe are through these characters. And these are going to be like very, very detailed pieces of concept art. Each one's going to be unique and each one says something about a different part of the universe. So along with these characters, we're creating a compendium of sorts. This is like an in-world encyclopedia. So when someone buys one of these characters, they can look up any little detail about their helmet, about their gun or their tool, their backpack, their suit, all of these things, and start even learning more and more about this world. Now, I don't know, you know, everyone's familiarity with what an NFT is varies quite a bit. Yeah. So let me give you my definition, because I mean, honestly, there's a lot of bullshit in this space. It is the Wild West, and there's a lot of like, you know, bandits and stuff snake oil salesman. For sure. And so what I think a lot of people just kind of get this gross feeling in their mouth where they see a lot of negative headlines where it's really taken us, you know, delving deep to see, oh my gosh, for independent artists, there's actually like a huge potential here. So for us, like the NFT, it is a collectible, you know, it's, it's this little card. It's this little character that is, is, you know, your character in the universe, but that's like only the beginning of it. It's like the beginning of what will be a much larger journey. It also functions as, and this is where the metaphor is always a little difficult, whether you call it a festival ticket or a key, but it also gives you access to essentially the creation of the film. And 
in one sense, it's a little bit like a party or a music festival in that we're going to create this whole slew of virtual events that correspond with us actually creating the film. So we're going to have like seminars on spaceship building with like the artists. This is all going to be on a Discord social media platform that people can interact with. Then, like, at the same time, there's, like, this whole, like, very fun component where there'll be competitions. One of the things I'm most excited about is people will be able to compete to get their character, like, in the first film. So one of the things we're, like, trying to figure out now is, like, they might potentially, like, the first round is everyone writes, like, a bio for their character and the community votes on them. And there'll be another round where you, like, infuse more creativity into your character and it goes higher and higher and higher until we start getting these, like, stories that form made by the community that, you know, we can then actually put into the film. Or perhaps some of those turn into their own spinoffs. What we're hoping is all of these NFT holders really become like a think tank that help develop this universe. And these are like a couple examples. We have this like, you know, huge list of events that will start happening almost weekly after the sales of our NFTs. This will be an entirely different type of experience. One of the things I'm most excited about is that when you create an original idea in film, it's very hard to get it out there. We experience this firsthand with prospect. You have to have, it's like, I always forget the number. It's like double, triple, quadruple the amount of money you actually spend on the film just to market the film. But what we're doing with this model is people become invested way before the film ever comes out. We're going to be like creating this like small army of people who have built the universe with us. And then by the time the film comes out, it will already exist in all these other formats with all these other very excited people who can, you know, help us spread the word and, you know, really give an independent project a much bigger fighting chance of success. Yeah. So that's kind of like phase one (laughs) of, of this journey. And then this is where I have to make like a, a legal distinction because we're now going to get into territory that the legal model doesn't exist for yet. Because yes, we, we, we want to make a film like this artist collective that makes the NFTs is then going to go and make a movie. And hopefully this movie starts as the launching point for the cinematic universe. If that is successful, you know, and this is a big if, this is all speculative. Sure. If that's successful, what we are, our eventual goal and dream is then to create an ownership model. And I'm talking like, you know, we're hiring lawyers, hiring programmers for the technical part of it, create an ownership model that actually allows the fans, the supporters, the people who are now diehard invest in this universe, as well as the artists and the creators, those two people to actually be the owners of the IP. Wow. No corporations, no hedge funds, no outside entities. That the future of this universe we're creating is now determined by those two groups. And, you know, in the Web3 space, there's a lot of talk about DAOs. And, you know, I don't know. It's like, this is where it gets like, we're talking about inventing tools that like don't totally exist yet. Yeah. You know, there are very rudimentary other examples, you know, kind of more in the video game space right now. No one's quite done it in film yet where you have stakeholders who all have voting rights. And, you know, when profits come in, you you know, all the stakeholders can vote to distribute them or to maybe go fund another film or maybe put it towards a video game. And we just think it's so cool to actually have the people who care most about the universe making those decisions. That is really interesting. That's where we hope this goes. Like that's the big idea. So yes, we're starting with just selling concept art. Like that's all we're doing right now. And hopefully it's like, you know, that concept art, you know, gains momentum. It turns into a film. Hopefully that gains momentum and it turns into this totally new way of making a cinematic universe. So to start with, for this first film, you're not even attempting that second part. That second part is like a future thing that you're trying to work toward, or that might actually be a part of this this first film, that whole collective ownership and all of that. It's going to take time to like literally like build the legal tools. And we've like, you know, we've hired lawyers now. We're working on it now. I think the thing is like, we want to make a film right away because it all doesn't really mean, you know, much until we have that first successful like movie. What we're hoping is to start playing around with this kind of decision-making power, even within this first initial group. So we're hoping to be able to actually put like, you know, certain creative decisions. And it's it's kind of the way I think about it. It's like, you know, we'll be able to, for example, okay, I have this idea for a scenario or scene. I'm going to make like a storyboard or maybe in this format, it's a little bit more of a graphic novel and I can throw it out to this group of, you know, several thousand like, you know, diehard supporters and get their reaction. 
and, you know, see the conversation like with, you know, this Discord community that we're going to form. It's very interactive. People will be able to talk to me directly and everyone will can weigh in and we can kind of see like, oh, whoa, well, okay, this could go in this direction. Maybe we should nix this. It allows us to kind of like work on these ideas together. And, you know, we might try to play around with like some voting. We are just like, you know, I don't know, maybe we try to throw out three spaceship designs and like vote on which one, you know, like have the community decide which one's actually going to be in the movie. There's a lot of fun ideas and there'll be a lot of experimentation in this first phase. And then hopefully what happens is that, you know, in success, eventually that stuff gets cemented into like an actual like structure that becomes more permanent. Nice. So it, it's very much sort of an experimental phase then. Very, yeah. Which I guess it has to be since this is completely, you know, this is the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah. This is like, it's almost thinking about, even thinking about of this as a film project is a little bit limiting because you know, I, like, I, I, honestly, I don't totally know what the metaverse is, but like we now start to see that, like, you know, putting these like really set containers on narrative isn't the way the world is going to work in the future. And the future isn't here yet, but already we see the fluidity and malleability of like storylines into all sorts of mediums. And so I think it's like there might be, you know, again, like whether it's graphic novels or like a 3D experience, I don't know, there might be official fringe like things before the movie even yeah we really want this like you know to, to go in all directions and i think you know one of the things that really drew us into this space on a creative level was how much it really jived with again kind of what i was describing earlier in terms of our approach to world building it allows us to break out of a linear structure and to build worlds collectively and sort of broader than the scope of like a single story so that we can have all of these windows into the world, whatever form they take. And, you know, start start investing our creative energy into a living, breathing foundation from which the stories can sort of unfurl. And on, you know, uh, the sort of the, the viewer, the user, the, the reader kind of level of experience. It's, you know, it's a much more, again, nonlinear, fluid, sort of immersive experience, opening up all sorts of different opportunities. It's so unique in that, you know, I, I think we're, we're very much, I, I think you guys are really kind of ahead of, ahead of your time with this. It's Hopefully cool. not too ahead of our time. <laughs> well, well, it's in, in two ways. Like, I think what you're doing is of right now, but your thinking is ahead of its time as far as what anyone else is thinking at the moment, which is no surprise. I mean, look what happened with music. They they were chasing their tail forever trying to figure that out once it bypassed them entirely. And then it took years and years for them to be like, okay, this is the new model. Where it seems like you guys are pole vaulting past the norm right now into what likely could be a new model. And of its time now, I think, because this is such a community thing. And, you know, you look at Marvel fandom, you look at the DC fandom and all other forms, you know, it's, it's Sonic comes to mind. The The community changed what Sonic looked like. And what you guys seem to be doing just feels like bypassing the, you know, the sort of outrage machine. And instead of inviting them into the living room to sit and be friends, you know, and 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 be a part of all of that and and be allowed, invited to love bypass it. Bypass the outrage machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Whereas, I, and I think you get the outrage machine because I feel like, you know, our generation and below, it's such a different thing where they feel the ownership of something they don't have ownership of and then it's ripped away from them in ways that they can't control and so there's a hurt there to them you know because they weren't a part of this uh thing that they feel like they are that they feel like you know that ownership it means something to them and you guys are inviting them in and and, and saying if this means something to you come be a part of it we want you here whereas the others it just feels like we're making money off you whether you like it or not so i think that aspect of it of one you know brilliant way of getting your stories told in the way you want to tell them. You don't have to have someone telling you what to and not to do anymore. Brilliant. But then on the other hand, the sort of utopian view like you were talking about that this feels like to me of you know, realizing that the stories that you're building and telling are going to become someone else's either way, you know, if they love it and it means something to some young kid and it turns out to be the reason they want to make movies, you're inviting them into the process. And there's something both brilliant and beautiful about that. It's just really cool. And and um, so so with this first film, you're going the NFT route and you're you're selling these basically digital trading cards. Is that a fair way to, although you don't trade them, they, you, you, you're buying characters. It's always two things though, because I think it is, it's like, yes, it is a digital trading card, but it's also like a ticket to a music festival right. that also like might 
never end. <laughs> like it's, right. like, what's it's the an metaphor? invitation to the living room. I don't know what the room. metaphor yeah. is. That's why, because it's something brand new. On the flip side, it's also, you know, theoretically down the road, it's, it's you know, collectively, um, everyone who is a member of the Fringe is, are the executive producers yeah. for this universe. For sure. And Web3 gives us the tools to actually manage that. Could you talk about Web3 a little bit for anybody who doesn't know? So Web3 is is kind of the more general term that refers to any process that uses blockchain like technology. So when you buy a Drifter NFT, you know, a lot of people think you're buying a JPEG. That's actually not what you're buying at all. Right. What you're buying essentially is a code that exists on the blockchain that says you own that JPEG, but also is your key to like everything else we're talking about is that code. It says that, yes, you are part of the club. You get to join and be part of everything else we're doing. Another way, of, like it gets dangerous with analogies as we yeah. establish. <laughs> sure. But one way, like especially kind of that, that, that helps me think about it. Thinking back to kind of our experience with crowdfunding, you know, we financed the prospect short film on Kickstarter. Right. And yeah. that was a whole experience. And, you know, quickly realized that this is not just free money. This is something you have to like really work for. And, you know, through the course of that whole project, yeah. learned a lot about that. And one of the things that we took away from that was like outside of the the money that we got, probably the more valuable thing was the community of fans that we established even prior to the production of the film. Yeah. So that when it came time to release, we already had a group of people that had a vested interest in its success. And I think that helped us get the eyes on the short film that we needed to actually go and make the feature out of it. But fundamentally also, just like on a personal level, there was just a certain amount of discomfort interacting with Kickstarter in the sense that, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're begging people for money. Right. You know, it's just that kind of pure patronage model. It's like, will you please give us money because we're artists and we need it? And that just, you know, never felt super sustainable. It was a way to get a single project off the ground, but this isn't a way to like build a career as a professional artist. Yeah. And one of the things that's exciting about um, the NFT technology is that it makes a similar type of relationship much more substantive. There's actually an exchange of assets. There's actually a stake in something that has value. And then we're able to, because, you know, fundamentally NFT technology creates the, the premise for, for digital ownership and digital scarcity. And so that we can, we as, you know, the concept artists and, and you know, just the, 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 the team that's designing all these things can create actual assets now in the digital space. Then we can exchange them and, you know, it, it creates just a much more substantive relationship with the fans and the holders of these NFTs. And so it's akin to crowdfunding in that we're garnering support to build something bigger, but it's all very like transparent and concrete and trackable and not just a bunch of promises into the air and at, and just, you know, begging for patronage. And these N NFTs, is each one unique to the person that bought it? Like, can one person, can multiple people buy one specific one or is each one unique? There's only one. Yeah. Once it's taken, it's taken. E each one's going to be completely unique. And I thought this is also something you don't hear very often, but I actually love this format now that we're several months into making them. We are making, you know, if, if you can compare making these NFTs like to making the concept art we have any other film. I mean, we're just making like a thousand fold more. Yeah. I, I don't get to just make the like, you know, five characters that appear in a movie. I'm getting to make like the entire universe. Right. It is a generative system. So where essentially instead of designing individual characters, we design, you know, sets of elements that then, you know, work together. I think people are going to be really excited about what we're doing, particularly because we're going to like, we're investing a lot more into this art than I think a lot of other NFT projects do because we're trying to make such such a big universe. There will be, you know, characters that exist on all sorts of different planets, in different environments, with different gear to tackle different situations. You know, we have a massive, at least for me, what's, I mean, not like Star Wars massive, but what for an independent film is we have a massive team of artists that is just like running wild in every direction right now. And yeah, I really can't wait for people to see them. How many assets around about will you be putting up? That number is a little TBD, more, more, more so like, I mean, I probably would be able to give you a better answer in like two weeks because I think right now we're trying to figure out like the amount that we can like meaningfully generate. Right. So the way the process works is we like, you know, like right now we have, you know, a, a couple thousand and then we, we 
we do tests and see, okay, how do we like how this feels in the universe and how we want to tweak it? And so like right now we're essentially perfecting the collection and that does, and the amount of them does play into that because we want it to feel like you are seeing a lot of individual characters, not just a bunch of weird kind of repeating patterns. Right, no copy paste. Exactly. With this first film and this first process, it's it's just these like digital concept designs that will be the N- NFTs is just a bunch of different concept art for the film. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So they will be, they'll be like, yeah, like, you know, characters on, on a card per se. Yeah. You know, they're designed, you can use them as a social media profile if you want. And then also immediately upon the sale, like people also then be able to enter again, this social media platform, this discord server we're creating where all this other stuff starts happening. Is the entirety of the budget going to come from this space? Or do you think you might pull like investment, maybe traditional investment to sort of supplement what this does for you? I mean, I would love to not have to seek traditional investment. And again, this is where I might have a better answer for you in two weeks because we're still sort of, you know, running the budgets because we need to not just make a film. But again, it's like hiring, you know, lawyers and programmers to also progress, you know, these other processes at the same time. And so we're still we still are kind of nailing down that that sweet spot. But, you know, I mean, in my in my, you know, utopian vision of the world, this this all happens in a very independent space. That's awesome, man. And then once you you get that, you, you make the film. Do you have like a sort of a timeline? of when you would like to be shooting the film or is this this sort of gets going and then the pre-production process gets going and it's do you see it happening more organically or do you have sort of a time frame you're trying to hit going back to prospect prospect had seven months of pre-production wow which for a little indie film was like a ton for us it wasn't enough <laughs> like and so this is like again this is like right at the heart of it is like we get to set our own timeline that's cool and it's not gonna be like you know these fans who are like you know, have like, they've got their character and they're excited to see the movie. It's not like they're just going to have to wait forever because they're going to be like in the shop with us. We're going to be like sharing things. I mean, avoiding some spoilers, right. but sharing things that are like part of the world as we go. So it's going to probably take a little longer, like than seven months. You know, I can't commit to like, you know, 12 months after we meant there'll be a film, but it's like, we're going to start like very quickly yeah. though. We want to take our time again, making a film that you couldn't make under the conventional system. We want to make a film that's just like so, so, so detailed and like has all this texture that our most passionate supporters will appreciate, you know, that a hedge fund might not. Right, yeah. Do you have the script for the feature complete already? Are you already working on it? Or will that be a part of the collective process as well? The script won't be done until, you know, the day before we're shooting. Sure. But <laughs> well, a draft, I suppose. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're, we're pretty deep in on, on the first film. But I got to say, we're going to be a little coy about it because the other weird part of this process is like we literally don't want to spoil the film for our backers. Yeah. As, as we're starting to like, you know, really finalize the story, we're also like wanting to be like, all right, how can we like reveal parts about it without like, you know, giving the whole thing away. So like right now on this first phase, what we're trying to do is paint a picture of the universe of like the big picture of like all the ways it can go. And then once, you know, after we sell these NFTs and we have our group of supporters, you know, all together in one place, we'll start kind of putting out little pieces of that actual film, but in kind of a slower, satisfying way that kind of gets everyone excited and tees up that first movie as opposing just, you know, kind of like leaking the whole script and everyone already knows everything before it comes out. Yeah, that was actually kind of my second question is, is, is how do you roll that out with, of course, anybody being a part of it wants to be a part of it, but they want to also experience the end result. It's a careful balance, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you have two productions happening at the exact same time, the the production of the film and, and this production of it, including this group, but, you know, being cautious to protect their experience of the final product. Another thing I'd add to that, though, in terms of the development of the actual feature film script is that one of the things that's so exciting to me about this is that it really clicked into place. The NFT project really clicked into place as an extension of the same ethos that emerged of making prospect in its development process. And to clarify there, you know, one of the things that happened over the course of our journey of trying to get financing over years where we'd, you know, we'd button up a draft of the script, we'd fly down to Hollywood, we'd pitch a bunch of people, we'd entertain some bites, but then for one reason or another, something would fall apart, be it for the fact that we wanted seven months of pre-production or otherwise. (laughs) And then we'd go back to the drawing board and we'd keep working on the script. But over time, you know, every time we went out to pitch it again, we were trying to make the package bigger and bigger. And we were working with our core members of our production design team, concept artists, 
to create concept art designs of, you know, props, sets, characters, and all these things. And by, by the time, you know, we were close to getting financing, we were slamming this big coffee table book on the table right. that was full of concept art. But one of the things that emerged out of that process was that the script development was happening in tandem with the design of the world. And for For us, one of our primary ambitions is to really push what you can do with production design and storytelling in the pursuit of making the world as self-evident as possible. To try to take as much exposition as we can out of the dialogue, out of the mouths of the characters and have it just be apparent and to really facilitate that sense of immersion, to, to be that fly on the wall where people aren't, the characters in the film are real people. They're not, they're not tools to pander to the audience to explain things to them. And with science fiction, of course, you're introducing a lot of weird new mechanics that there aren't necessarily like, uh, you know, immediately recognizable precedent. And that's a really yeah. exciting challenge for us. And so, you know, through the course of that whole pitching process, I, I think that the, the constant conversation between the design team and the writing team really fused the story where these things click into place together. The production design was not just a second layer of glaze that, you know, treated a pre-existing script. It, they were both being developed in tandem to work together and to be this kind of like organic merger. And even at this early stage, which I'm hoping is the beginning of a really long journey, uh, we're already seeing that happen within our, you know, the collective of artists that's putting together this NFT project. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about like non-linear world building is, you know, through the act of like, we're, we're currently like, you know, every time a new piece of art gets put out, we, it gets put into the, the roster to create a compendium entry, which is, uh, you know, in-world encyclopedia that has, you know, all of the linguistic flavor of the world and the way that people talk in this world. And we get to use these uh, uh, prop, essentially, elements as points of reference to build narratives around them. Where did this come from? What, That's you cool. know, what historical event was maybe this particular tool or gun significant in? You know, are there weird stories behind the manufacturing and design of these things? That to me is like what it's all about in terms of having s narratives emerge from this rich foundation. That is incidental to the story, not purpose built for it. And so, you know, with the NFT sale, we are inviting a bunch of people to participate in that. So, yeah, like the script is not finished. It's going to be sort of a collective act of us all building this world together to sort of, you know, really, really fuse the story and the world together. That's so cool. It's almost like you're you're getting these like rich, amazing writing prompts throughout. Exactly. Yeah. Of like, who could this be? You know, it's it's like a documentary <laughs> narrative process of some kind. It, it, that's that is so interesting. So w once you finish the this first film, you do your NFTs. You know, it's going to be successful. I have no doubt. You make the film. How do you go about distribution for this? Is that do you have a different plan for that as well? Are you going more of a traditional you know streamer or a theatrical or straight to the people that maybe like, what's what's the plan there no i think actually and this is maybe where we differ from some other perspectives but i i mean for one it'll be dependent on the climate of when the film comes out sure and what's cool is that by you know being in kind of having the reins of that we'll be able to be really agile and responsive yeah you know, it won't be part of like a multi-studio contract you know mess so like we can figure out but at the same time it's like we're not making this film for a small group of people we're making this film for a much wider audience. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, maybe it still goes straight to Netflix, but the thing is that, you know, the IP will stay, you know, with, with the core group. So you have the idea, you have a draft of the first. Do you know, like, once this is successful, you know, if, if it does what you're hoping it does and you can continue on, do you know what the next step after that is? Or is that, are you allowing to let that be an organic process with the community you build? Or, or are you like, after the first feature, we know we want to do the graphic novel after that, and that'll take us to this. Do you have that roadmap or are you leaving it open? I mean, I, I think we have a number of goal posts, but I, at the same time, it's like, I'm really excited to see how it, it you know, evolves. Right. So I haven't mapped out, like, five movies. However, it's like, there's a lot of storylines, but you know, it's like, I could see it's like, well, maybe after we do this first film, it seems more natural to actually do something more episodic. And it's like, I could see graphic novels coming out at the same time or even before the first film comes out. And you know, what I'm excited, I'm less experienced. I mean, we have some friends who are a little bit more in the video game space, but particularly, you know, people who generally embrace cryptocurrency and Web3 are very video game savvy. And I'm very interested to see if any organic partnerships, you know, emerge there that maybe one of these storylines kind of lands, uh, you know, in that format. 
Yeah, it's all predicated on the direction of, in success, the direction of the support and the enthusiasm and where that takes us. That's all the more reason for this to all be built on sort of a, a foundation of a world. And that's why we're framing this as like yeah. universe first. And the stories that emerge from there uh, can flow more organically. That's great, man. You, it just sounds like you've built this giant playground for yourself. And it's like, <laughs> you're pretty sure yeah. you know, you know, I want to go to the slide next. But if it's like, you know yeah. what, let's do teeter totter instead, <laughs> okay, you know? Fine. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. Then I think, you know, man, that sounds fun. I, I love this giant sandbox you've built. I'm really excited to see, you know, this come out and see how it works for you guys. I think it's incredibly smart and does sound like the future to me. So I'm rooting for you and really looking forward to see how, you know, it all goes. Yeah. Let me, let me tack on just one more thing that I think is important too, because I think uh, in, in terms of the, the public perception around Web3, there's this kind of growing sense that it's pretty environmentally unfriendly. Right. Sure. And I always feel like I want to address that in the, in the same breath because I don't feel, yes, I might have a utopian vision for how something can work in the future. If that is literally making, you know, the climate crisis worse, it, right. no, anything new should be a step forward. So I, you know, for people who are interested, um, and this gets a little technical, but I'll try to make it brief, is we are minting on the Ethereum blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain has a roadmap to be incredibly energy effective in the future right now. It's, you know, not there yet. So as part of this project, as part of this first phase, we are going to look to make uh, carbon offsets a part of, you know, the collectible pine process. We have people working on calculating our carbon uh, footprint that'll be part of this mint so that it's just like a natural automatic thing. This will be a carbon neutral project. And in the future, you know, people who follow our footsteps won't even have to deal with this issue once once it's resolved, which is just super important to us. That's awesome, man. That's great. And and great to hear too. I, I love that. I love everything about this project. I love everything about the universe that you've been talking about. I uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me and our audience about it. I'm just really excited to see where it goes. Of course, we'll put links to everything so everybody can find it and become a part of it as well. But thank you very much again, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that's it for today. A huge thank you to Chris and Zeke. If you want to know more about their project or them in general, where to follow them, where to see that teaser that they made for this, jump over to filmriot.com forward slash podcast and find the episode page for this episode and you'll find all of that there. Of course, you can find me online pretty much at Ryan underscore Conley on all the things so you can find me there. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Repeat.